Hey everyone, APA Coach Daz here and welcome to episode 19 of Daz DTV. In this episode, we're going to be talking about resistance training guidelines for youth and adolescents. Like many of the videos that I've done so far, the inspiration for this one was from recent conversations I've had with coaches and parents that I'm working with. I've been training up some new coaches that work for APA and this is something that's come up in conversation. Much of the information I'm going to give to you has come from the 2014 International Consensus on Resistance Training for Youth that was co-authored by uh, Roger Lloyd, Avery Fagenbaum and Mike Stone to mention just but a few. So I strongly recommend that you check it out if you haven't already. One of the things that it says which is really important to stress is that it's vital that the fundamentals of technical competency are prioritized at all times. I think we can all agree that when you're working with an untrained athlete or someone who has got a low training history, that it's important, first of all, to get the techniques right. One of the things, though, that it does say, which I'd like to discuss a little bit in a second, is this. Over time, the external load can be increased, provided exercise technique is sufficiently improved. Initial prescriptions should use low volume, one to two sets, and low to moderate training intensities, greater than six, or sorry, less than 60% of 1RM. Now, hold that thought, because when you think of intensities that are less than 60% of 1RM, what do you think of? You think of typically higher reps, right, 12 to 15 reps. What it goes on to say, though, is that when children are initially exposed to multi-joint resistance training exercises, e.g. squatting, then multiple repetitions might be counterproductive for motor control development. Instead, it is recommended that children perform fewer repetitions, one to three, and are provided with real-time feedback after each repetition to ensure safe and correct movement skill. So this is a really important point that I was discussing with my coaches because on one hand it's saying keep the intensity less than 60% 1RM, but on the other hand it's also saying with an exercise that's quite complex, like a back squat, that's a multi-joint exercise, maybe you don't want to be doing 12 to 15 repetitions in a row. Maybe you want to keep the repetitions to one to three. For me personally, I can understand where they're coming from. Uh, I wanted to just highlight a little bit about my training philosophy so you can see where I'm at on that particular uh, discussion. On the left-hand side, we've got a little bit of information about the APA uh, training method and specifically the peak performance or the peak preparedness pyramid. For me, it follows a, a fairly traditional classic development pathway from movement efficiency to strength to power and then power endurance. Now, obviously, in the sport that I'm mainly working in, tennis, power endurance for me represents the end stage goal. And I've put here, which I don't know if you can read, a suggested end stage uh, goal of being able to do 10 reps in 15 seconds of a jump squat at 40% 1RM of your back squat. Having 20 seconds break and then being able to repeat five rounds of that and being able to produce the, the amount of power in terms of bar speed and then obviously load that you're looking for, 40% 1RM, uh, over five rounds. So is that a perfect test? No, but it just gives you a bit of an example of a way that we could potentially uh, determine if someone has got the necessary levels of strength and power and then endurance to be able to, to do that test. But one of the things that I think would probably uh, have more, more discussion points on would be this potential strength standards idea. I, I, I personally feel that it was useful to have some kind of idea of how much load you might expect a, a non-competitive weightlifter or powerlifter to do um, as they go through the, the APA training system. So again, I must stress this is for a tennis player, it's not a competitive weightlifter or powerlifter, but this is what I put out on the forum recently, which I had some discussion on with some coaches. I said the basic one, I'm concerned with body weight back squatting, and I think you can do an infinite number of reps of body weight exercises, but I put 20 reps as a guide. At the next level, for 15 reps, you could do 50% of your body weight. At the next level, for 10 reps, 70% of your body weight. At the next level, 
And for five reps, 100% of your body weight. At this point, once we get into the advanced level, we're talking about post-puberty now. For three reps, 125% of your body weight, and for one rep, 150% of your body weight. Now, I think everyone who I showed this to before agreed with me that, yeah, you've got to let competency guide progression, that there's no hard and fast rules for non-competitive powerlifters and weightlifters here. You've got to really um, coach who's in front of you and take into account chronological age, biological age, training history, technical competency, training frequency, blah, 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 so many different factors. And one of the key things that people did comment on was, you know, Daz, are you really developing strength with 10 to 20 repetitions? Is it really a neural adaptation that you're getting there, a motor skill adaptation, or is it a metabolic one? And I have to say that, you know, it depends on how you use the back squat. If you use it with the guidelines that was intended in the position statement, clearly that is a way to maximize the safety of that environment with a, a new athlete, an untrained athlete, or someone who's uh, not got technical competency. You're not going to be looking to do 15 or 20 reps in a row on a back squat, which is a multi-joint complex exercise. But I personally think that for me, movement efficiency isn't just about this motor skill development and the neural pathways of development, but it, there is a place for to developing some metabolic adaptations as well. And I, I don't really mind what you call it, but I like to use the word anatomical adaptation. And I know that when you are trying to promote uh, favorable adaptations in the tendons and the ligaments, that as well as them responding well to intensity, I believe they also respond well to volume, which can come from, in my opinion, higher reps as well. Now, the advocates of strength training will say, well, you don't need to do 20 in a row, but you could just do 5 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5 in technical kind of cluster sets, and you'd get similar adaptation. But for me personally, I do think that if you're doing 20 in a row, it does have a different effect on the body. And I'm inclined to do some training with the back squat for higher reps. Now, the last point I'm going to make on this is there is a nice section on repetition velocity here. And I'll tell you what it says now. It says, repetition velocities may also fluctuate within a session. For example, the movement preparation phase, including low load technical warm-up exercises, may consist of slower controlled movements. However, the main strength and power exercises, inclusive of weightlifting and plyometric exercises, will involve rapid movement speeds. For resistance training exercises, the mass of the resistance will govern the velocity at which the movement is performed. So even though they were speaking about repetition velocity there, for me, they could also be speaking about repetitions per se. And using that same analogy, I think it does depend on where in the session that you're going to be put in the back squat. If you're using the back squat as a primary weightlifting or sort of strength exercise, or a skill development exercise early in your session, then of course it makes sense that you wouldn't be doing 10, 15, or 20 reps. But if that athlete has got a good training history and a high level of technical competency, and you do decide that you want to use the back squat as one of your resistance training exercises to build high levels of metabolic and muscle endurance adaptation, and you're going to do it later in the session, then I don't see a problem for using it for a high number of reps later on in the session for 10, 15, 20 reps provided that they have the technical competency and that you're doing it to promote more uh, adaptations in terms of metabolic anatomical adaptations rather than, say, neural ones. So for me personally, that just gives you a little bit of background on my training philosophy. I'm totally in agreement that movement efficiency has to be based on technical proficiency, but my definition of what movement efficiency is is based on volume and intensity, and I do think there is a place for um, using the back squat in multiple different scenarios, both for higher load, lower rep work, for maximum strength development, for lower load, lower rep work, for skill development work, and for lower load, high rep work, for more metabolic and anatomical adaptation. So I hope that makes sense, and if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to contact me, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks. I'll stay